learn to read like birds learn to fly. And they just walk by the library and they get it. And uh, about 20% of the population is blessed with that, that, uh, that, that's those skills. And on the other end of the spectrum, uh, where I lived, uh, and uh, about 25% of the population, those uh, have difficulty learning how to read, write, and spell. And adults that can't read, we have something, some things in common, like we grow up thinking we're dumb, and we bought into a big lie about our brains, because we can learn to read, and it's never too late to learn to read. And the key to teaching people like me to read and write and spell is proper instruction. And proper instruction comes from teachers and tutors that have been properly prepared. And they come from universities. The teachers come from universities that properly prepare them. I graduated from, uh, I started out at 48 years old at a public library, had a volunteer tutor, 65 years old, never, never did any teaching at all. She just had a love of learning and she had a love for reading and she thought no one should go through life without knowing how to read. And uh, she uh, got me to about the sixth grade after uh, a year and a half of working with me. And I thought I died and went to heaven because I was reading. Uh, but I only had about uh, just a baby step there. Because once you get that, that taste of it, you want more. You want to get out of the sixth grade and go on to the seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade. And you want to go to college. And you want to, you want to do everything you could possibly do with this beautiful brain that you have. Uh, and so uh, I went into a, a program, the next program, because I outgrew, I actually outgrew my tutor. She got me there. And, uh, and that's not negative at all, that's positive. I, I outgrew, I went to the next level, I had some diagnostic tests, and uh, they discovered something in that science there. And I had a severe auditory discrimination problem. And then I spent 125 hours uh, working on what they, they discovered and uh, the problem and then the treatment. And I went from the second grade nonsense word attack skills to the 12th grade level. Boom! I got it. You know when you get one of those big, I got it, finally. And uh, so I have still been uh, learning to read. And people ask me, how long did it take you to learn to read? I said, it's going to take me the rest of my life to learn to read. Because you keep reading and reading and you get better and better. How long did it take you to learn to write? Oh, the rest of my life. Because you just keep doing it and you keep doing it. And pretty soon you really fall in love with it. Uh, I have, a, have had an opportunity. I kept this secret, you know, on the tape you saw. I really guarded this secret. Because, uh, well, you know why. Uh, I told you why. And some of you know why. Because if you can't read, people think you're dumb. And who wants to go around advertising with the sign, I'm dumb? Not going to do it. Uh, and we aren't dumb. We are not dumb. And some people think, some people think that our brains have something to do with language. It's, it's, a, it's a skill that can be taught. And uh, science backs up what I experience. I mean, I'm a, I'm a walking proof of, of uh, that it's never too late to learn to read and that there's proper instruction and I, and I got that proper instruction and I started, this is the hard part of being an adult and because we're suspended in our childhood, academically, spiritually, intellectually. And so when we come to the learning table, for whatever reason we come, we come with a train full a baggage. You know, we don't believe that we can actually learn to read. We're just there, you know, and we can't believe it. And uh, I almost quit uh, my tutor for a month straight. I just said, this poor lady thinks she's going to teach me to read, but she's not going to teach me to read because there's something broken up here. You know, it doesn't work. And uh, she proved me wrong. <laughs> I want to, uh, uh, how about, how about the students in here? Raise your hands if you're a student. 
students. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Uh, am I talking for you? Am I saying some things that the rest of the world needs to hear? Okay. How about how about tutors, literacy providers, teachers? How about how about you guys? Okay. All right. All right. Well, uh, I wanted to start out today with a with a, a prayer, and uh, since I'm in uh, North Carolina, I'll go ahead and include God in my prayer. Uh, when I'm other places, sometimes I just lead out the Lord, and and I call it something else. But uh, here it is, my my start, and uh, <clears throat> the gift of of, of uh, dialogue. Dialogue untides knots and opens doors, resolves conflicts, makes persons greater. It is the bond of unity and the mother of brotherhood. Lord, make us understand that dialogue is neither an argument or a battle of ideas, but a search for the truth between two or more people. Make us understand that we need each other and that we complement each other. We have something to give and a need to receive. I can see what others cannot, and they can see what I do not. I would like to share a few uh, verses of my poetry. One of the things adults do when they first, probably the first thing adult new readers do, we write poetry. And people think sometimes, they think that it's because we got this heart full of all kinds of feelings. But we write poetry mainly because we don't know what a complete sentence is. So we cut it real short. <laughs> kind of an inside, inside uh, the Beltway story about us. Uh, some of you may think I'm old, but in my mind, I don't think I am old. When it comes to reading, I am bold, or so I am told. And perhaps I am bold because I know more people need to be told. It's as important to teach an adult in America to read as it is to teach a child to read. And we, we have sort of this myth, and I'm not saying it's not important to teach a child, it's equally important, but anybody that needs the opportunity to learn to read should have it. And learning how to read changes lives, and that you, Tutors and teachers change lives and sometimes save lives. And uh, I can tell you a, a thousand and one reasons why America needs to know how to read and, the, and people need to know how to read. But one of them is, is, uh, is because we need to love one another. And teaching a person how to read is an act of love. And we know love is the greatest of them all. Uh, I get to say that here, and I'm talking to you here, but if I was talking to a bunch of uh, people that wanted uh, uh, employees to read uh, and do a better job, then I'd be singing a different song. But I'm going to be talking a little bit about, about love, but we all know there's a lot of other reasons. It gives you so much independence. People ask me sometimes, what's the difference? between knowing how to read and not knowing how to read. And I say, it filled a big hole in my soul. And I think if America teaches all of us to read and write and spell, it's gonna fill a big hole in America's soul. And you can't address the education issue uh, without dealing with basic reading and writing. Because think about school. What, what's the, what is the language of success in school after the third grade? It's the written word. And so we find out early that we don't fit. I'm going to read some more to you and then I'm going to tell you a story. And uh, my wife will be telling me about my time. She'll be pushing me along. And they say she's the better half. But sometimes I think she's about the better three quarters, you know? <laughs> You're supposed to be just be half, okay? Uh, I have had a chance to, to address uh, a task force in, in California. And I, I've been invited to, by a task force here to speak. And in California, it was, a, it was a, uh, from the public education 
and they were asking how they could improve uh, special education. And I submitted uh, a 10 page uh, written uh, comments, and now I have a. What do you say? <laughs> Speak into the microphone. <laughs> She's telling me I can't read the whole thing. What's our time? About 15 minutes. Uh, 15 minutes. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read part of it. They want to hear your story. <laughs> I know. Uh, for the first six years of my life, I was told by my parents that I was a winner. Millions, like millions of other innocent children, I spent, I was sent off to school with high hopes of learning how to read. However, I was also one of millions of children and adults that have difficulty learning how to read. In the second grade, I ended up in the Dunrow. In school, by the time I was eight years old, I was a loser. I did not learn as a lad at eight. I learned to read as a man of 48. And I have to say that was great. But don't you think a man who learned at 48 could have, should have learned at eight? <laughs> and wouldn't that have really been great? Thank you for being here today to engage in this critical dialogue. And it does untie dots. Uh, and I will respect my better half. Uh, and one of the reasons I like to, I like to read, I know I can talk. I talked my way through life for 48 years. And finally learned to read, I write it down. So I like to show off every once in a while <laughs> and let you know that I can read and I can write. And what's so amazing to me, when I write something, I say, whoa, how did that idea get down there? And I, it's talking back to me. And it gets to talk to the rest of the world. What power. That's why we hunger for it. And that's when we don't have it, we hurt. And we're outside. And we get outside of that box when we're three years old, uh, third grade. Uh, like I said, I went to school with high hopes. My parents loved me. So you're going out to school to learn to read. I got there that first year. It wasn't bad, first year. You just line up, and behave yourself, and enjoy recess, and uh, color some things. And then they move you on to the next grade. And it's a little bit of the same. And then they, they introduce the ABC stage. Uh-oh. Stuff is getting real hard for people like me. I had math skills. I could do my math. I could count money before I made, uh, I could count money, make change before I got to the second grade. So no, a teacher didn't have to teach me too much about counting money. I knew already how to count it. And uh, then I went on to the third grade. And the third grade, and, and I call that little, little boy and little girls that go in the first and second grade, we're really innocent. We're innocent. We didn't do anything. And uh, we just went there. And then pretty soon, we're required to do these other things and that we can't do. And we can't satisfy the teacher. And they have bluebirds and redbirds and buzzards. <laughs> and uh, they have the dumb row. And they send a message out to us the buzzards and the dumb row that, you know, we don't fit. We're kind of on the outside of it. And the demands for, for reading is increasing. I'm passed to the third grade. Now I'm passed to the fourth grade. And in the fourth grade, the innocent little boy is left behind. Because <laughs> now comes the native alien and he is being left out. And when people are left out, when they're oppressed, in some way, a human spirit rebels, whether it's passive or aggressive. And I did both. And by the time I got to, to fifth grade, uh, I was in trouble. Uh, I would rather turn my desk over uh, when the teacher called on me uh, than, than be embarrassed. And I'd be sent out of the room, sent to the principal's office. In the seventh grade, I spent most of my time in the principal's office or out in the hallway. I was suspended from school. By the time I was in the eighth grade, I was, I was expelled from school. Uh, and I, I actually, uh, I made a lot of teachers cry. Let's put it that way. But they made me cry also. And so it's by the time I'm in the fifth grade, I'm at war. This is not a friendly place. Now, I didn't have any trouble outside of school. I didn't have any trouble with the police. I didn't have that much trouble at home. I did have five sisters 
So you, and then no brothers, so you know I'm going to have a little trouble there. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and I was well. Uh, now I'm, I'm in the fifth grade, and I'm just, I'm not doing anything. And they're still passing me along. And uh, I get to, sometimes people ask me, why don't you ask for help? Well, little boys, innocent children, don't have to ask anybody for help. And they don't know how. What kind of help? I don't know what kind of help this is. And when you get to be a teenager, and we all know some teenagers, you don't want to even talk to them anymore. Because you've given up on yourself, because they gave up on you, it seems, and you give up on them. So it gets kind of hostile there. And I want to I want to just give you a little bit of insight into that native alien age stage and the and the stage of the innocent child. The first poem that I wrote was called The Native Alien. And if you think about it, a native. I was born here. I'm here. This is my home. But I was really an outsider. I was an outsider because I could read and write the language that, that was for success in school and the workplace later on. Uh, and like I told you, this was the first poem I ever wrote. And I want to give you a little bit of more insight into the feeling of those two, two little personalities or sub-personalities. Native alien, here from there, you can be found everywhere. Going through the motions, showing your emotions. Oh, native alien, you are lame and literate society plays its games. They keep looking for someone to blame. Isn't that a shame? Don't they have any idea of our pain? It seems so plain, but they keep looking for someone to blame. What a national shame. They give us our promotions and they put us through the motions. Bluebirds here, redbirds there. Now we have jailbirds everywhere. Oh, how we tried. Oh, how we cried. We were just past five. And how we had to hide. Oh, how we had to hide. Oh, how they stole our pride. Oh, how they lied. Native alien here from there. Native alien everywhere. Shame, shame. We can't read and how this nation bleeds, but they still will not heed why Johnny, the native alien, still can't read. Oh, how we tried. Oh, how many times has he died? Literate society, you can't hide. Oh, literate society, how can you lie? State, state, scapegoat, cover up, alibi too. Oh, literate society, shame on you. Oh, literate society, you can't hide. Illiterate statistics, have your hide while you choke on your own pride. Native alien, he can't read. It limits him, we can see. But he has ideas, concepts, and theories too. And that's the step of thought that you ought to concede too. Now that's the first poem. And that was the first expression of my anger, my life anger. And I put it on a piece of paper. And putting it on a piece of paper doesn't hurt anybody. But it scares some people. It ruffles people's feathers, and that's not what I wanted to do in my advocacy. You know, I share that with you to let you have the insight and let the world, but you just have to sort it out. And who I am now, I'm not the native alien anymore. I'm a man with a mission. And what I want is to be able to communicate. And I want to tell you about the desperation that we experience and how much we depend on the literate world to understand that urgency of breaking this cycle of illiteracy. Eighth grade. And, and we can't do it without ourselves. Eighth grade. Eighth grade, get me to the eighth grade. She wants me to the eighth grade. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm in the eighth grade and I'm really tired of uh, embarrassing my family and embarrassing myself and all the things that come along with trouble. You know, I didn't want that. So I decided to go underground. I was in high school and I had athletic skills, you know. And uh, I started getting interested in relationships with girls and other people and all those things that happened in high school. So I better go, go to clean up my act. And I changed my relationship with teachers. And I, I really became, I guess you say, I play, started playing the system. And uh, what do they call uh, when you kiss up to teachers now? What do they call it, kissing up? 
teacher's pet. We did. So you, you start behaving yourself and do things for teachers, be nice and smile. And if, you, if you're really nice in high school, behave yourself, you can get a high school diploma. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I uh, dated the valedictorian, the smartest girl in school. I hung around with college prep kids. And I would rather be alone than hang around with somebody that was going to take me to get in trouble. And I was smart enough to do that. And uh, I built my oral vocabulary and I copied those, those people that knew how to talk and had those big words, you know. And, uh, and the other thing is, if you were in a group, when you're talking, you can just be quiet. They don't, they, they don't know if you're dumb or smart. But when you're in school, they tell you to read something, you're caught. You got to do something. And uh, I was too big to be invisible and too big to be, uh, uh, to hide all the time. Anyway, I'm in the eighth grade. I'm now in high school. Uh, I'm figuring out how to cheat just a little bit, uh, playing the system. I graduate. I have athletic skills. I got uh, offer an uh, uh, athletic scholarship at a Division I school. I'm reading at the second grade level. I can't write a sentence. But what else am I going to do? Maybe, maybe I could go to college and I'd get it. And I used to hang around libraries thinking maybe I could just get it, you know, hanging around libraries. But I, they were also, that's where the girls were hanging out too. So maybe I, <laughs> I didn't have that, right? I want to go back to the second grade for just a second because people always ask me, why don't you just ask for help? Why don't you ask for help? I went to college and I was on a scholarship and I could have a, I could have a, a tutor anytime I wanted to. But you know what? I couldn't have a tutor because they were, they were the co-eds. You know, they were the girls on campus. I'm not going to be messing up my dating and, and my social life, you know. And besides, I couldn't trust anybody. If, if a girl... If, you, if a girl knew you couldn't read, you know another girl's going to know you couldn't read. <laughs> That's just the way they are. I had five sisters. I knew that one. But I didn't trust men either. I didn't trust anybody, and especially in college, because I'd be out. Now, I'm, I'm in really deep water there. And in college, I started, I really worked on the system. And every course... And I'm not going to be able to tell the details of that college situation, but I want to tell this story about the second grade uh, when people ask me, why didn't you ask for help? Okay, they're going to let me do it. Uh, but I want to tell this one about my reaction sometimes when people ask me questions. Why didn't you ask for help? Well, when I, I already told you when I was a child I could, when I was a, when I was a teenager, I, you know, I didn't trust him. Then I get into college. I'm, I can't ask anybody for help. I'm, I'm not going to be going to college anymore. Uh, and, I, and I also want to tell you that I had an athletic scholarship, but the athletic department and the university didn't have anything to do with me cheating or me getting a degree. I did all the cheating, lying, and, uh, that on my own. It was my strategy. It was my desperate strategy. When I, I did ask when I was eight, eight years old. I used to ask God every night uh, when I was eight years old in my prayers. I said, please Lord, tomorrow when the teacher calls on me, let the words come out. Let me be able to read. And uh, I was, you know, I'm, I'm working on a Zapper miracle. And uh, you don't get a lot of Zapper miracles because God has a different time schedule for, for answering prayers, you know. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm saying that prayer. One, sometimes I would just get out of bed, turn on the light, and get a book, and try to read it and see if I got it, you know. But it wasn't there. It wasn't there. So I did ask. And then through that, by the time I was a teenager, I quit asking God because I got mad at him too. Uh, cause I didn't, and that's, that's what happens to us. You know, we quit all these things. and So depressing, so discouraging. Uh, to be outside, and it's such a disconnection. But I do want to go now, jump up to college, and tell you a couple ways that I cheated. When through. did you get your Zap miracle? Pardon? When did you get a miracle? When did I get it? Oh, I got it. I got one yesterday, <laughs> but I got it when I was 48 years old. And then, then um, I was asked if I would share after I learned to read. I learned to read at a public library. They wanted me to tell my story and tell the world and 
and recruit people and, and motivate people. And I said, <coughs> no way. Lived in the same town. My wife was a professional. But they kept, and, but there was, a, there was a voice inside of me that said, you gotta go tell this story. And I asked the, the native alien if I should go. And he said, don't bother with them. They're not going to listen anyway. So don't tell them and don't trust them. And I asked the little boy. And uh, he said, go do it, man. Go do it. The big people will hear you and they won't let children hurt. Go do it. And uh, so I had this conversations going on in my head, thinking about it, thinking about it. And then I had these, these uh, literacy people like, like that lady right there, keep asking me to do something all the time, you know? Uh, and they don't, they don't quit. They just keep asking until you say yes. I asked my wife, uh, I, no, I didn't ask her. I just said, Kathy, they're asking me to, to speak publicly. And, you know, I was just throwing it out. You know how husbands and wife do? They just throw the little bait out there and see, see if anybody bites on it. Her first, uh, opinion was it she says why don't you just shut up and read that's where she was you know so uh, and I understand that looking back at it uh, now I got to go to college and tell you at least one or two stories about how I cheated my way through college and this is not fun for me to stand up here and tell you I'm a cheater and a liar this is not fun this is why they want to tell the story I still don't like telling it right now Matter of fact, I'm, I'm trying to delay and run the clock out, so I don't even have to tell that story. But I will tell you a few things. In college, uh, there were, I belonged to a social fraternity, and social fraternities kind of kept the files and the test of professors. You know, like there was a lazy professor that gave the three, he had three exams, and every three years, you know, he gave the same exam, a different exam. So all you had to do is find out what year you were on, what rotation it was, and when you go in and take that test, you got the answers. And uh, that's one way. And uh, that was an easy way. But I had, I had some challenges, and I had a challenge in, in Dr. Gregory's class, who was a, a government teacher. And uh, essay, first, another thing we used to do, I used to do, is to check out the teacher. Do they give essays? Stay away from those essays, man. Uh, they're, they're really tough, or even short, short answers, you know, they're, they're a little tougher. But I figured a way out, all of them. Uh, Dr. Gregory, uh, fun exam, four questions, one was a bonus, uh, three were required. Uh, midterm, final. She write them on the board, and nobody knew what she was going to write on the board, and I don't even think Dr. Gregory knew what she was going to write on the board. I think she was maybe 90, 100 years old. And, but she wasn't lazy. And, uh, and I, uh, I had to make a plan for that. And I had this buddy who was uh, brilliant, very smart. And uh, he, uh, he, I asked him if he would assist me in a plan that I had to get through Dr. Gregory's class. And he was willing. He's a shy guy, by the way. And he, uh, what the plan was and what we did was, uh, it was springtime, first floor, open the window, sit in the back of the room, painstaking copy those questions off the board. You know, when I say painstaking, it'd be like if I put Chinese up, up on, the, on the screen there and gave you a pad and pencil, I'd say copy that for me. Mm -hmm. You could copy it, but you wouldn't know what it said. And that's what the scribes did too. They copied, but they didn't know. I passed it out the window to him. And I know when you're lying and cheating, you're not supposed to pray, but I'm praying for an hour and 45 minutes that he knew the answers to those questions and that he was going to get that, that blue book back into my hands. And another thing you had to be cautious, you had to, you had to really plan this thing. You sit behind the older students because the older students are going to rat you out if they see something like that. If the, your peers see it, they just think you're clever, uh, good, that's, that's a wish I could do that myself, uh, attitude. Uh, anyway, he got, the, he got the exam back in. I turned it in, I passed Dr. Gregory's test, and, uh, and uh, I told you he was shy. He wanted to go to the spring formal with a girl by the name of Judy. 
I arrange that for him. And that's what you do when you're young, you know? And sometimes people ask me, why would anybody want to do that? Well, these are the same kinds of personalities when you're 18, 19 years old that put a Volkswagen on the second floor of the girls' dorm, you know? Hey, nothing else to do, you know? Uh, now, I, do I have time for this last one or not? Yeah. Okay, I get to go ahead with the, the, uh, the grand, uh, the Mission Impossible, we'll call it. Uh, I had a professor that uh, he, uh, I couldn't figure out how I was going to get through this course. And uh, he had two exams, and he, uh, came, you know, some of you that have been in, in school, and most of you have been in school, the professor was reading off the exam. I knew he had it, and he was saying, now, if you know this, you're going to do fine. If you know this, you're going to do fine. And, uh, and he did that two, two or three times, meetings, and he said, that's what's going to be on the exam. And I went over to visit him one night. This is about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, to his office, which was on the second floor of the, the business administration building. And he wasn't there. So uh, I, uh, I opened the window. Uh, and I used a butter knife to open, unlock it. And I went in his office. And I looked around. I knew it was in there. I knew he wouldn't take it home. It had to be in there. Looked around, looked through the drawers and everywhere, the shelves and so on. Couldn't find it. It wasn't there. So I left discouraged. Did that two or three nights and found the same thing. The test is getting closer and I had to do something. So I got three of my... John, you didn't tell him there was a file cabinet that wasn't... Oh, there was a file cabinet. I was going to do that for Kath. You never give me a chance. Ah. <laughs> uh, We've been married for 48 years. And she's filled in a lot. 49. 49. <laughs> it's been so much fun. I didn't do so much fun. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, there was a pop in there, but it was locked. And uh, uh, so I got some guys that crew together, you know, and three guys. And there were four of us. We went in there. Uh, and... Uh, and carried out the four-door file cap. And four-door file file cabins are heavy. You know, they got paper in them. And, uh, but we're young, and we got to put it in the car, drove off campus to an apartment, uh, not far, three or four blocks off campus. I lived in the athletic dorm. And these were, these were some of buddies of mine, and called the locksmith, and I had already checked on the locksmith, and the locksmith came out, it's about three o'clock in the morning, it was about 2.30, I guess. And, uh, uh, I put my suit and tie on, you know, looked like a young businessman, and uh, do, just, I gotta win the Oscar for this one, you gotta go all the way. I mean, the, the guy at the locksmith, he doesn't care what it is, he just wants to check, you know, in the middle of the night. Uh, but I play, I've been playing it out, and he comes over there, and he does his magic, and he opens the file cabinet, I got the test, and uh, I gotta get the file cabinet back now. Uh, we gotta get it back. I got the test. And I also got something else. I got a bonus. I, didn't, I wasn't really even thinking about but I got a key to the file cabinet, which gave me an opportunity to have take another class from the professor. Uh, anyway, we get it back into the, into the office, and uh, my buddies dropped me off at the athletic dorm where I lived. And uh, 100 athletes lived in that dorm. And I was walking upstairs and I was thinking, mission impossible, accomplished, you know. I'm clever, lucky, you know. Why would anybody do anything so desperate as this? Uh, and I go get in bed and I lay my head down on the pillow. And I start crying. And I start weeping like a baby. Because not only am I, am I violating the trust my mother and father put in me. And they thought I was away at school, getting a college education. But I was now, I moved from just a cheat and a liar. Now I'm, I'm really a burglar. I'm really a criminal. Uh, and so I just want, I, I tell that story, and I'm embarrassed about all of that. Uh, but it was, uh, it was about our desperation. My desperation. My only way out. And I was trying to, I was trying to, 
to me looking back is that I was always curious about learning. And I think everybody in here is curious about learning. Isn't it nice to learn? Isn't it exciting to learn something? And I just, I needed literacy, the passport to success in school, and the passport in the workplace. And I wanted it. And that's what I did. And, and I, have to, I have to say, I know, I know as a child you understand you can be empathetic. And as a teenager, you can understand me being a teenager and being crazy. Uh, and you can understand uh, going, trying to get through high school. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated as I go out of college and I teach school for 17 years. And a teacher is a seeker of truth. And I'm lying. Even though I'm doing some things that are very helpful and progressive, the things that I did in the classroom, I was certainly empathetic and I worked hard and I had, I had more guest speakers than anybody in the whole county. I showed more videos and, and movies than anybody else. I didn't have a dumb row in my classroom. I had a row and a, I, circle. I, a circle. There she is again. Jump it in. <laughs> I would have caught it, Kathy. <laughs> anyway, uh, and I'm not going to tell you much more about that teaching. I, there, this may sound like a commercial. It kind of is, but the rest of the story is in the book. Uh, but what I really came here to do is to validate what you're doing in North Carolina and validate what I, I, these folks are all doing and to say, let's move the pot, that simmering pot, up to the front burner and to solve the problem of illiteracy, we have to articulate the problem first. You know, we have to have an understanding of it. And for, for struggling readers and adults, you know, we have to really truly believe, and I'm here to congratulate you for your efforts. Don't give up, it's never too late to learn. Thank you for being here.